Confessions. I love this movie so much. Um, it's so many things at the same time. It's a celebration of an artist. It's a celebration of an art form. It's a picture of youth, that, that really specific moment when youth is kind of, you're on the cusp of still being able to call yourself youthful. <laughs> it's terrifying. There's a, and it's also a portrait of New York City, a specific time. It's also just an amazing movie musical. It's so many things at once. Um, uh, I want to start with you and ask uh, the most boring Q&A question of all time. Just how did how how this start? What was your relationship to Jonathan's work? How did you come to want to do this? This is your first film, uh, which is extraordinary. Um, yeah, I'm I, I'm I'm painfully aware that I'm I'm sitting here and I have the privilege of talking to you because I saw Rent on my 17th birthday. Uh, I sat in the yes, I sat in the last row of the Nederlander Theater, and I was I was a kid who carried around a VHS camera. I found it easier to film my friends than to hang out with my friends, and and so you know, cut to the musical starting, and there's Anthony Rapp as as Mark with his camera filming his friends instead of hanging out with his friends, uh, and I felt personally attacked. Um, <laughs> And I, I had never seen so much diversity uh, on a stage. I had never seen, uh, I had never heard such contemporary music uh, in a musical. And it just felt so homemade and, and so full of love in a way. It didn't feel like some mega musical handed down from on high. It felt like someone put their life and their art and their friends into their work. And um, that's when I went from loving musicals to thinking I could maybe write one one day. And then, yeah, yes. Um, and and I, think, I think Jonathan Larson did that for a generation of artists. And then I was a senior in college when I saw the off-Broadway version of Tick, Tick, Boom with the amazing Raul Esparza as Jonathan. And, um, and it, blew my mind and I have no idea what anyone else felt but it felt like a message in a bottle just for me it was just sort of like oh you want to write musicals huh it's going to be a lot harder than you think those people you came with are going to get real jobs and you're going to be the only one banging your head against the wall uh, while everyone else grows up but if you want to do it it's a great way to spend the day, and and that always stayed with me. And it was it was incredibly clarifying experience for me. It was like a homing beacon, and um, and then the great Julie O uh, came to me in 2016, uh, many 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 years later, on the other side of Heights and Hamilton, and said, um, "I have the rights." to Tick, Tick, Boom as a film, and I said, uh, no, no, me, me, it was the fastest email response. Um, I'm the only person who can direct this movie. If they only let me make one, this is the one I, I understand. Mm. Um, and, and here we are. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I want to ask about uh, how it like, came together. I guess I want to start there with St Stephen and also, also Lynn, in terms of adapting, uh, because this is a real, Adaptation, you guys really, you know, had to get your hands in the dirt for this one because it's, um, I was thinking about how in addition to just adapting it for the screen, there's also the layer of, you know, obviously, you know, Jonathan's early death and how that affects uh, how the audience is going to take in his story through the musical. Can you guys talk about how you guys approach the adaptation? Well, I, you know, the first thing, with the first time we ever talked about this, Lynn said, uh, if we're going to do this, we should go back to the monologue, which is, which is what this show was. It's all that it was uh, in Jonathan's lifetime was the rock monologue of him on stage with a band uh, telling this story. And, um, and that, was, that was your thought from the beginning was to frame this film around that monologue, um, which is a little more complicated than it sounds because they're he performed the show a, a few times in his life, but there was never a definitive production. It was never professionally produced. So there is no final script of this is what Jonathan wanted it to be. So we had the opportunity to go to the Library of Congress in DC and go through his archives and find a bunch of different drafts, um, none of which were dated. And so it was very unclear like which came first. Um, and, and there were cuts between them, and some songs would go in and come out. And then it was just the fun work of us, like getting to excavate those drafts and, and pull out what we thought 
seemed uh, right for the film and, and, and lose what didn't seem right. Um, and that, that was really the fun part, was getting to, to dig through those drafts. Uh, Robin, you've obviously, you've, Nolan, you've been, you guys have worked together before, you guys have know each other. How was it though, uh, working with somebody who you're close to and you're friends with, worked with in other ways, uh, when he's directing his first film, talk about the process of, uh, of how that working relationship worked. It was like yeah, it was really cool. Cause, <laughs> what well, was cool? Cause like I'm not gonna lie, and I think I've said this to Lynn before. I was kind of like, I love my friend, but what's gonna happen when he's directing? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I was Monster. like, Monster. <laughs> so I was like scoping. I was like, I wonder what this is gonna be like. And then I remember having this moment where you came up with a shot on the fly, and it was so cool. No, it was really cool. And there's that moment of like, our lives are like extraordinary is ordinary to us. So like all of our friends are fierce, but sometimes it's so normal that you forget. And like in that moment, I was like, <laughs> my friend's fucking fierce. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, that's really cool. It's really humbling. It's really beautiful, but it's also like, it, it, it's inspiring. It really, really pushes you to, to grow yourself as well. So that was dope. I guess I mean, it's, it's such a beautiful performance that you give and the uh, emotional resonance of that friendship. It, I can only imagine with the complexity visually of the movie that you mapped out, I and mean, I'm assuming you guys didn't have forever to shoot it, in terms of the technical approach to it, and, and this goes for everybody in the cast, um, because you guys plumbed so deep emotionally with it. How do you, on set, how did, how did it work? Were you very specific in terms of your shots? Was it... Did you guys rehearse a bunch? Did you do a lot of rehearsal beforehand, or? Yeah, we rehearsed a lot. I, I mean, I think that's the that's the lesson we all take from from theater is is we rehearsed this thing like it was a Broadway musical. Um, and yet, um, the fun of making a movie is finding whatever the magic in the room is on the given day. Like you also have to be able to throw out the plan because oh my God, we're on this street and what is that person doing over there and can we frame it that way? Like you're, you know, you, you rehearse and you rehearse and you rehearse and then on the day things happen and you have to sort of allow, uh, allow the magic to happen. But yes, I mean, we rehearsed musical numbers and we rehearsed, um, we did a lot of previs and, um, you know, it was, um, yeah, it was a lot. And there was so much painstaking research, too. You know, this is a real life. This is a, a very specific period in time. And so, you know, one of the most amazing things, I want to just shout out Alex DiGirlando, our production designer, for the look of this movie. Um, we would just freak out Jonathan's surviving friends and family by touring the apartment because it is the apartment. We had this amazing video that Jonathan himself shot uh, because he was scared there would be an electrical fire and like it would burn up his stuff. So he filmed his entire apartment on a camcorder for insurance purposes and he's doing this monologue. And, but as a result, we have this like incredibly detailed video of every book on every shelf and every cassette, and that's what you see in the movie. And and our fidelity was always sort of to Jonathan's life, and then and then finding our own magic with this incredible company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Andrew, you've done you've done film, you've done uh, theater, you've never uh, done musicals though right i want to ask you about the singing uh and uh, which yes. yes please you are right to clap yes it's the correct response uh how we i mean you dove into the deep end of the pool man <laughs> you were your first musical performance and congratulations it's, it's incredible talk about how you how you approach that both technically in terms of the singing side of it and uh, why don't you just talk about how terrifying it was uh, getting up there with <laughs> seasoned Broadway legends and uh, yeah. singing your heart out? There's too much to say about it. It starts with Lynn being a fool and uh, <laughs> and thinking that I could do something that I, I, I at that point couldn't do. And Lynn is missing a couple of synapses. Uh, he, he he has the he has the ability to. Um, to have a, a, a confidence, a kind of um, a three-year-old's diving towards, you know, a, a, a pool of fire, and knows somehow that he's not going to be singed, um, and and it was contagious for all of us. And I I remember him coming up to me one day 
after he heard of me sing a phrase of 3090, he had snuck in the back with um, me and Kurt Crowley, and we, we were rehearsing 3090 for the first time in the rehearsal room, and he had snuck in, and we did one phrase, and then his shoe came, came flying <laughs> past my face, and um, I, I, it felt loving, and, uh, and he, he, he screams at me, Andrew Garfield, you can sing, and then he comes up to me very quietly, and he says, Whoever gave you the idea that there are certain things that you couldn't do, I would like to sit them down and have a stern word with them. <laughs> because I was freaking, like I was freaking out because not only, you know, it's Lynn and Lynn's a hero of mine creatively and uh, like to millions of people around the world. And f f for me, it's like he asked me to do something, it's a yes, and then I figure out how to do it, and, that, and, and I had the time and the space, and then I had the support of these thoroughbred fucking musical theater racehorses. <laughs> and Josh and, and Vanessa and the, and the rest of the company just like, like riding the wave of like these geniuses. Like it's like, it's superhuman and Olympic what they do. And, and then I had Liz Kaplan who is a, a voice whisperer and just kind of started peeling the onion. And then I had Greg Miele, who's peeling my, my body off. And then I had, you know, John, John Larson as the North Star. And it was a village, it was a whole village. And it was like, oh man, like I, I, I got to do something I wanted to do all my life. And I got to, to learn how to do it through Jonathan Larson songs. Like, I am the luckiest boy alive like it's it's official like that's that's it uh alexander you're, you're so fantastic in the movie that that last rooftop song uh i want i'm i'm, I'm curious for you this goes for everyone i want to start with you in terms of um you know, in terms of research, in terms of when you're approaching something like this where you are telling a story from real life and telling somebody that means a lot to a lot of people and you're, how much for you do you, is it about, um, is about the script and working with these guys and how much do you dive into, into research about, you know, about who you're playing and about his life? Well, the first thing that I do is I look at who the character is, who is Susan? She's a dancer, she's an athlete, she's working through an injury, she is a hopeless romantic. And I really kind of started with that. So before we started filming, I went into training to learn how to dance because she is not a dancer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, but after this movie, you know what? I feel like a dancer, you yes. know? We went through it and we did rehearsals and rehearsals and I wanted to find that body and how she carried herself. And then once I got to New York and started working with Lynn and really coming up with who Susan was, not only in real life, but like inside of me and how I could bring that out it was just really beautiful. And then diving into it with Andrew and our relationship and what that looked like in, in real life and through stories with people in Jonathan's life. And then finding that love language with us was just really important in the beginning. And uh, it felt good. I feel like oh, it great. felt good, yeah. It was good for us. I liked it. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Robin, Andrew, same, same, same question. I'm curious. You know, balancing performing from you know a very a place that's inside you against the research and also just being conscious of you portraying somebody's somebody's life. What? Uh, how'd you guys deal with it? I mean. <sighs> For me, I felt like it was all pretty straightforward. Like, I, I always feel like the first thing I need to do is just get off book. Like, I, I want to memorize things. And then I want to know where my character's sort of trauma, sadness comes from, because then that shapes, for real, I want to go back, I want to like, what messed them up? And then where, how did they grow from that, right? Lines, <laughs> trauma. Yeah, I have, to, I have to get the lines out of the way. But, but you know, it was also like, for me, I always try to center the, th the qualities that I wanted to bring out. Like I wanted to, center, I wanted to make sure that you saw a loving friendship between a, an out gay man with a straight dude. Like you don't get to see friendships like that that are so intimate and like lovey-dovey and touchy-feely. So it's really cool that we get to model that. Um, and then the other thing was like, w w there would be these really cool moments that I feel like Andrew and I had where 
we'd get into the space and then like otherness would come in. Like that divine energy would enter the room. I felt that way that day on the street. I remember we did the rehearsal and Lynn looked at me and said, hurry up, we gotta go, let's shoot this. Like, cause we just knew there, there was a presence in the air. And so it was all about like removing our egos and getting our junk out of the way so that that beautiful otherness could come in. Um, and I think what helped me invite that was also thinking about the fact that as a queer Latina man, I don't have elders. They're gone. They didn't get to make it. Like the systems didn't have their back, you know? And so to share a story of a gay Latina man who's HIV positive in the 90s and got to live, whoo, <laughs> like it's, it's for the ancestors, genuinely. Uh, Andrew, same, same question. I mean, playing Jonathan and, and the weight of that and bringing such a vibrant personal performance like you did. Um, yeah, how, how, do you start to, how do you start to approach that? What was your way in? It, <clears throat> so it, it's the same answer. It's, it's, it's John as ancestor. It's, it's bringing in his spirit whenever we could however we could through whatever means and sometimes it was just looking at at Julie hmm. Julie Larson our, our producer and Jonathan's sister who's here who was by the monitors a lot of the time and then other times it was listening to glory you know before uh, a, before the scene where um where Stephen Sondheim leaves his voicemail like I had that, I had um, one song, Glory, playing in my head. And there was something magical that happened that, happened that day. There was an energy in the room. There was, there was all my lost <laughs> loved ones in the room and, and, and they were all speaking through Sondheim, telling Jonathan, telling me, you gotta do what you gotta do and you know what that is. Like, that's the space that Lynn sets up and that's the, 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 the cast of people that, that he brought together. And that's what we got to do every day. We got to be devoted to John and we got to be devoted to all struggling artists, all, all people who were taken far too soon, everyone that was lost during the AIDS epidemic. We got to, you know, when we were doing the New York Theater Workshop, one man show, um, Boho Days, there was spirits in the room, it was, it was, it was the place where John, where John um, previewed Rent. And we got to shoot there by some u cosmic non-coincidence because we weren't gonna shoot there. Right, we, we had a, a bottling plant that we were building to look like the New York Theater Workshop and then the pandemic happened and it became incredibly important to support the New York Theater Workshop and to support all those off-Broadway theaters that were shuttered and so, we had this glorious week filming in Jonathan's artistic home, but our holding is at La Mama Theater across the street and this other theater up the road. And so um, that incredible, but, but that kept happening. Like I, I really, you know, um, like there was a moment where there's this incredible song called Swimming that was cut from the off-Broadway version that you heard here that is about doing something, anything but writing your song until you make space for inspiration. And our location scout found this amazing swimming pool downtown. And as we walked in, we were like, wait a minute, there's a red striped tile down the middle. There's these number markings that only make sense uh, in the lyrics of the song, and we found out it's where Jonathan swam. Um, it's literally he's making references to things that only exist in that one pool uh, in New York, and, and that was the place we had chosen. And then, you know, Jonathan Burkhardt, who's one of uh, John's best friends, was like, oh, yeah, we swam here all the time. Um, and, and that's where we filmed, and we filmed at 508 Greenwich, where, where he lived, and you know the whole beginning of No More. We're, we're doing the five stories of his five-story walk-up and, and in that building, and so we really tried to kind of create conditions where John would arrive and tell us what to do. 
and he did. He absolutely he did. did. Like he kept he kept us up at night. Like he I didn't I couldn't he didn't let me sleep. Like it was that. It was, you know, he's the kind of guy that that knew I believe somewhere deep down he didn't have a long time to sing his song. He knows that we all leave here with a with a half-finished song and and for me the ticking was this unconscious I've got to get it out now. I've got to get it out now. I don't know why. And then no accident. Um, I, I mean, it's hard to to imagine it as an accident that, you know, the, the cosmic coincidence that he passes away at the age of 35 on the first night of the first preview of, of Rent. Once his work has been somewhat done, there's something remarkably mysterious about that for me. And the ticking felt like a true genuine thing of a man that felt like he was, for whatever reason, running out of time. Is it about turning 30? Is it about th th this relationship that, that wants to be consummated in some deeper way? Or, or is it something deeper? Is it this unconscious urge that will not let me sleep because I've got to get as much of my song out as possible in the short time I have? Mm -hmm. uh I want to, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up soon, but I want to ask about the Sunday morning diner scene. Because uh, <laughs> holy shit. Uh, so, yeah, dude, just start talking, please, about that scene. So, so, you know, this is a song that obviously Jonathan Larson wrote in loving homage of Stephen Sondheim's Sunday in the Park with George, one of the greatest end of act ones in the history of musical theater where George Surratt, yes, where George Surratt creates his masterpiece and creates uh, the frame out of the frenzy and, and the craziness of his life. Um, and Jonathan only ever performed it as one man band. It was always Jonathan playing it at the piano with his band. And so I wanted to make the choir of Jonathan Larson's dream. Uh, dreams. I just wanted to make this like a galaxy brain. Like, what would be? I, I kept thinking of like those posters. I, I had one of these as a kid, where like Amy Winehouse is sitting next to James Dean, is sitting next to John Belushi, and, and Marilyn Monroe is in the corner. Like, what is the Jonathan Larson Galaxy Choir? And so, um, you know, I burned up my Rolodex. And I called, you know, beginning, beginning with the great Bernadette Peters. Um, yes. And guys, don't spoil this. I know some of you are filming. Like, don't spoil the surprise for people who are going to see this uh, in maybe on Friday and maybe in a week and a half on Netflix. Um, but I really wanted it to be um, just the... the the choir of Jonathan's dreams. And so, you know, it's everyone from Cheetah Rivera and Andre De Shields and Joel Gray. Um, but then I also wanted it to sort of live outside of time. So I have, you know, Beth Malone, who plays Big Al in Fun Home. Uh, and then I have the Sky two of the Skyler sisters uh, at the bar and and Bibi and Newworth and, and just, you know, everyone in there is just like a musical theater legend and and across many different generations um i was i was at the ziegfeld uh at midnight when chicago the movie <laughs> came out um i'm that nerd and when cheetah rivera showed up in the prison scene in chicago that was a moment yo that was a moment um and so when i so when we were storyboarding this i was like 20 Cheetah Rivera's in Chicago. Um, that was my goal, <laughs> was the gasps we, we heard tonight and, and really kind of turned the moon dance into Jonathan's masterpiece and turn it into his frame, into his Sondheimian uh, hat. And um, uh, it just makes me really happy you reacted the way you did. Uh, I think I speak for everyone here when I say, I want your Rolodex. <laughs> I want them as mine. Uh, you, you mentioned um, uh, that you were filming when, and COVID kind of in the, striking right in the middle of your production. I wonder if you guys, and, and this goes out to the whole group, I wonder if you guys can talk about um, not just dealing with, dealing with that as, a, as an obstacle and how, how that worked with the shoot, but also shooting in New York. You, you've talked a few times just about how the spirit of all of this stuff was infused in almost a magical way in how you were shooting. And you can really feel 
that you guys went through that, hearing you guys talk. Um, talk about shooting in the city and shooting about musical theater in a time when musical theater was going dark. And um, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I just remember March of 2020 and, and you know, I, I watch it now. There's so many scenes where I'm like, that was, that was before, that was after. And um, th there was this moment where the movie, we paused, I think for two weeks, was the, was the first official announcement. And I just remember thinking, this movie's never going to happen. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, we'd filmed, we'd shot 10 days, I want to say. And it felt like, yeah, they could still, you know, like th that's not bad to let it die and uh like like maybe that will happen and we were at jonathan's apartment building the yeah day we shut down and and it just felt like the world it, it just felt like our movie's going to get made ever again you know it was that moment that i'm sure we all remember uh where it just seemed so implausible that anything would happen again and then as the months went by we started to have these zooms production zooms where pretty quickly actually talking about what are we going to do when the movie comes back how are we going to get it back and it all just felt so quixotic to me. You know, it all felt, it was like a fun thing to imagine, but it felt like this is not gonna happen. And it kept feeling like that. Like, wait, we're shooting next week? That's not gonna happen. And then, and, and every step of the way coming back has just felt, I, I think it's part of what you're talking about, the serendipity of it all, and feeling like tonight feels so remarkable because it really didn't seem like it was gonna happen. It really felt like, uh, everything has been sort of miraculous with this movie, and so I, I just feel incredibly blessed to have been a part of it, and, and to actually be here with this finished film is, is crazy. It's funny, I remember right before, that, that last night when we were shooting was the first night where I wasn't experiencing a mini panic attack. <laughs> Genuinely, like I, I, was, I was having, I was, I was really worried that I wasn't gonna be able to do this. Like, my nerves were at a point where I was just like really, really frazzled. And that last day we were shooting before the shutdown, I remember taking a deep breath and going, ooh, mm, thank you, because this is fun again. And then we fucking shut down. <laughs> it was like, what, what, what is this about, you know? And I was just like so mad. I was like, and I'm gonna have to rev up all over again, you know? But the really, really, cool, beautiful thing was like, there was so much self-reflection that happened during the shutdown, there still is. And it was like every damn day facing mortality, every damn day facing so much darkness. And we came back to shoot and I was on some shit again having these attacks. And then one day when they, when they announced Biden winning, I remember, <laughs> yeah, thank God. I remember I looked at you, Lynn, because I was frustrated with something, and you looked at me like, motherfucker, what's wrong? Like, there's nothing going on right now, and it was just like me creating. And I walked out, and I saw Van Jones crying in my trailer. He, he was crying on TV. The TV was in my trailer. He was in your trailer? He was, no, can you imagine? No, Van Jones was... I, I had special report. I had CNN playing. Just sobbing in your trailer <laughs> alone. <laughs> but I, he was sobbing, and then I did, because... He was crying about the proximity of the election and the fact that like, yeah, Biden won, but like, look at how close this was. Look at how many races, mother flowers we got existing in this world, right? And I looked at that TV and I was thinking about this like mini panic attack I just had and I thought, well, now that matters. Like that's real issues. I'm creating. I'm like, my parents are factory workers. They have no high school education. <laughs> they didn't finish high school. And I'm number two on the call sheet after you, with you, directed by you. Why would I choose that? <laughs> I don't think I would have gotten there without the, the pandemic. I don't think I would have come to terms with my ego and my creativity in that way. So um, it's pretty badass. Ashe. Ashe. Um, some logistical things about this pandemic. It's hard to direct with two masks on. <laughs> I had a mask and a face shield. I have a very expressive face. I was not allowed to use it while directing this movie. Most of it, uh, I had to learn new terms and find new ways. A lot of jumping up and down to show my excitement. A lot of charades. Um, but, but also, 
um, we have incredible producers who made miracles happen. We made a movie happen before there was even a vaccine. I have to thank Celia Costas, and I have to thank Julie O. Yeah. I have to thank Netflix, who paid our crew even when we weren't filming, and they got their full pay way beyond when we worked um, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and um, everyone was so committed to keeping each other safe. Um, that, that, that really was like such a hallmark of, of our work. And it was, um, it was really joyous work. And, and the themes of um, creating while you can, like every theme that, Jonathan, that was racing through Jonathan's head was only intensified by, by making uh, this movie when we did. And, and I think it's, it's, you know, it, it's gratifying to see it up uh, on that screen. And I'm so glad we're on the other side of it and yeah. we finished it. Well, it's... Uh... Uh, it is an extraordinary movie, guys. If 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 you dug the film, I know you all did. I want you to all go out and spread the holy word about it because it opens up November twelfth. It's such a special film. Please shout it far and wide. Uh, let's give it up for this amazing team. Thank you for being kick, here tonight. Kick, boom. Thank you.